This is Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Let's get into it. When justice is done, it is a joy to the righteous, but terror to evildoers. That is Proverbs 21:15. Guys, I appreciate you being here with me today. We got a lot to cover, but the very first thing I want to talk to you about is if you guys aren't reading, what exactly are you doing with your time? I mean, there's not a whole lot of sports going on all the time that you absolutely have to watch. You know, fantasy football doesn't start for a little while longer. Like, you know, you probably don't have, you know, another level you need to get to in whatever video game you guys need to be reading. And if you didn't know, we have a book list on our website. It's called the 100 Books Every Modern Christian Man Should Read List. You just go to our website, undaunted.life backslash book list. It is going to be in the show notes. And maybe I'll start making some book recommendations to you guys. If I did like one book recommendation a week, do you guys, I don't know, let me know. Would, would you guys want that? Because there's a hundred on there. But today I'm going to give you a recommendation. It is my favorite book of all time. It's a book called Fearless by Eric Blim. Uh, it'll be in the show notes as well. But that's a story about uh, one of the most resilient human beings of all time, a Navy SEAL that is now deceased, named Adam Brown. Just an absolutely fantastic book. But that is one of a hundred books. And there's a bunch of different categories. There's philosophy and apologetics and business and money and all kinds of things like that. It is a great, great resource for you. But Guys, in the quick hitter segment today, we're going to discuss the mass shooting in Illinois that happened on Independence Day, Jordan Peterson getting banned from Twitter, the spiking drug overdoses in the state of Oregon after they decriminalized essentially all hard drugs, and I will react to a viral video called The Ride Home, okay? And you will not want to miss that one. But before we get too in, too far into the subject matter for the day, I want to do kind of a, a really, really quick PSA. So some of you might know that there has been quite a bit of flooding that is taking place in different parts of Yellowstone Park this year. So for those of you that live outside the United States, uh, Yellowstone is not just a television show. It is an actual uh, you know park that's in the northern part of our great country. Specifically, the flooding has wiped out the north entrance road to Yellowstone Park, and that is located in a town called Gardner, Montana. So for that area, Tourism, as you can imagine, and all the revenue that that brings from people just dropping into shops here or there, that is a huge, huge part to supporting those businesses and those communities and thus the families that live there. Okay. But with all that wiped out, they're, they're kind of in dire straits right now, especially during, you know, this you know, highly touristed, you know, visited season, right? Well, a very, very good friend of the, sh- of the show named Sean Stevenson of Stevenson Knives out of Florida. I've talked about them before. I talked about them, I think, before Father's Day last year or Christmas or something like that. But they reached out to me to see if our listeners could help support a couple of businesses from this area to kind of help them get through this rough patch. Now, Sean Stevenson, he is actually sacrificing paid for advertising on this podcast for his own business in order to, for us to be able to talk about what's going on with these other two businesses. So I wanted to make sure to give him a shout out. He he probably is going to be mad at me about that. He probably would have rather me just not said anything, but he's literally, he paid for a spot that I'm I'm about to use for these other companies. So if you want to treat this like an advertisement, whatever, but I need to tell you about these two companies. So uh, both of these families that run these companies, I'm about to tell you about, they do a ton of to serve the veterans community here in the United States, okay? And I'm actually going to be hopping on board to assist them uh, and with helping a whole bunch more, and we're going to hopefully talk way more about that in the future on future episodes, so uh, stay tuned for that. But the companies are these. The first one is Mama Bear's Armory, and the other is Hell's Aurora Outfitters. So they're both out of Gardner, Montana. So let's talk about Mama, Bear, Mama Bear's Ar- Armory. That is ran by a guy named Chester Evett. So he is a disabled veteran. His nephew is a Purple Heart recipient, and his son is a disabled veteran as well. And these guys, it's basically a gun store. So if you've ever been into a gun store, you obviously know some of the things that they do. Uh, so that's the first company. The second one is Hell's Aurora Outfitters, which is ran by a husband and wife named Warren and Sue Johnson. Warren's nickname is Bull. But this is a horseback trail and hunting guide service. And so they actually host an annual horse drive on Memorial Day. And this year, this company raised enough money on their horse drive to purchase five track chairs so that they could get disabled veterans into the woods so that they could be able to hunt. I mean, just an absolutely crazy, awesome thing that they've done. They they do guided uh, elk and deer and sheep and bear and bison hunts all up there in that area, which by the way, that just became maybe right at the top of, of one of my bucket list things to do, to do a horseback led hunt for one of these great American animals that can serve, uh, you know, my family and feed a bunch of different people. So I'll put that up there, but guys, here's the deal. 
I want you to help out these two companies. Again, they are not paying for this advertising, but I want the Undaunted Life of Man's podcast family to show up and show out for these, these companies. Now, uh, let me kind of describe how you can do that. So with the first one, Mama Bear's Armory, uh, that is, again, Chester Evett. They do not have a website. Okay, so this is an old school kind of mom and pop gun store. Okay, so I'm going to give you their email and their phone number. And I know that's a little bit different. We live in this Amazon era where, oh, I can just, you know, boop, boop, boop. And then all of a sudden it'll just show up at my house a few hours later. I know it's going to be a little bit uh, cumbersome for some of you, but all this will be in the show notes as well. So if you're driving, keep driving and be safe. But Chester Everett, his phone number is 901-326-5777. Again, 901 901- Three two six five seven seven seven, and the email is mama bears with an s mama bears armory at gmail.com mama bears armory at gmail.com i mean guys show up clean out this guy's inventory this guy's got you know new firearms and used firearms and he's got a, a bunch of other stuff that can go with that and ammo and all these things and guys everything will be on the up up and up and so like if you're buying something from him it'll be transferred to a local ffl in your area but please please show up and support that company and the second one again hell's a roaring outfitters they do have a website it's hellsauroranoutfitter.com. I will make sure that is in the show notes. But if you'd like to just call them directly, they're 406 406- 848-7578. Again, that's 406-848-7578. Guys, book a hunt with these people. Pass this on to hunters in your life. Like I know people that literally go on multiple of these guided hunting trips every single year. So I'm going to make sure I share this with them. And as a shout out and a thank you, Stevenson Knives. I got their website here in the website as well. So if you want some great American made, you know, from the ground up, this is a knife that they made for me recently. It's got the Undaunted Life logo on it. It's all black because that's all I wear. And that's, uh, you know, basically what I like. And this will hopefully uh, be the knife that I will, you know, cut up a bear with whenever I go on a hunt here before too long. So again, guys, please support Mama Bear. Bears Armory and Hells of Roaring Outfitters out of Gardner, Montana, and also Stevenson Knives. So let's go ahead and get into today's content episode. So let's talk about the Supreme Court of the United States of America nuking the culture wars. Now, I would would like to have uh, come up with that phraseology myself, but that is actually from a quote from a Dan Crenshaw tweet. And so, like, I loved that. I thought it was great. But then I also discovered, like, there's a whole bunch of Dan Crenshaw hate out there especially from conservatives and Republicans. And to be honest, I don't understand it. Like they're calling him a rhino and they're mad about, about this or that. And like, I guess I just don't pay enough attention to, you know, blogs and, and Reddit and all these other different places. Like I don't understand the Dan Crenshaw hate. I know he's been on the show before, but it's like, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, have an opinion about somebody, but like, if you can let me know why people hate Dan Crenshaw, I'd love to know. But the Supreme court of the United States just wrapped up one of the most consequential terms, perhaps in the court's history, So it was certainly one of the most consequential terms that we've had in recent memory. Like I can't think of one that was, that was this big, that had this many big decisions. So let's go ahead and do a rundown real quick of some of the most important decisions this term, and then we'll break down why they're such a big deal. So obviously the headliner, the, the, the best of the best is on June the 24th, they announced the decision in the Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. And this was a 6-3 decision to uphold Mississippi's 15-week abortion ban. The majority was Alito, Thomas, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, ACB, and Roberts. And the minority was Breyer, Kagan, and Sotomayor. And then in a 5-4, I guess you could call it sub-decision, the high court voted to overturn Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood v. Casey, essentially returning the rights to create, you know, abortion law to the individual states. And that slimy, sloppy, mangy turd Roberts chose not to hop on board with that, but that's okay. There was a 5-4 decision, so that was overturned. And guys, if you want my full deep thoughts on this issue, go back to last week on episode 326 of this podcast. It's called Sifting Through the Fallout After the Death of Roe. I go into a ton of detail on that. But then also on June the 21st, they announced the decision of Carson v. Macon. So this was a 6-3 decision which ruled that the state of Maine must include religious schools in a state school tuition program. Otherwise, it would be in violation of the First Amendment. So this basically broke down on conservative, uh, you know, uh, conservative liberal lines. So the majority was Alito, Thomas, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, ACB, and Roberts. Minority was Breyer, Kagan, and Sotomayor. So speaking for the majority, Chief Justice John Roberts, he actually accidentally said something that was smart. He state he said that states aren't required to support religious education. He was very clear about that. But those that 
quote, choose to subsidize private school may not discriminate against religious ones, unquote. So and then Dan McLaughlin over at the National Review said this, quote, this is a huge victory for the freedom of religious parents to educate their children in the school of their choice on the same terms as non-religious parents, unquote. Then we had on June the 23rd, they announced the decision in New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin. This was a 6-3 decision again, which broke down just like the others, Majority Alito, Thomas Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, ACB Roberts, Minority Breyer, Kagan, Sotomayor. And this ruled that the United States Constitution does safeguard the right to carry a gun outside of the home. So the the center point of this case was a New York state law requiring concealed carry permit applicants to prove that they had a, quote, special need for a permit exceeding just basic self-defense. So if you were a person just walking around in New York City and you felt unsafe, which, of course, uh, most people walking around in New York City feel unsafe, you had to go to the local magistrates and basically prove how you had some sort of special need to defend yourself with a firearm. So many were calling this. You know, a lot of people on the left were calling this the biggest expansion of gun rights in decades, which is incredibly, incredibly disingenuous. Because what this decision did is it merely was giving New Yorkers the ability to carry out their constitutional rights as it pertains to firearms. Because this law, as I understand it, has been in place for decades. And so how many innocent people were were harmed or or killed in the state of New York, or really the state of New York, but specifically New York City, because they didn't have the ability to have, you know, a, a you know, force multiplier and a firearm. And guys, if you want a little bit more in-depth thoughts on the gun issue, just the overall gun issue in the United States, I addressed that recently as well on episode 315 of this podcast, standing on the bodies of murdered kids in order to take your guns. This was after the massacre in Uvalde. That will be in the show notes as well. Then on June the 27th, they announced the decision of Kennedy versus Bremerton School District. So this was a 6-3 decision that ruled in favor of the now fired high school football coach named Joseph Kennedy, saying that his First Amendment rights to freedom of speech and uh, freedom of expression were violated because he was fired for praying in the middle of the field uh, after football games. So it broke down just like the others. Majority Alito, Thomas Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, ACB Roberts, minority Breyer, Kagan, Sotomayor. So uh, in terms of the details from this case, this coach had been doing this for years. Basically, the game would end. He would, by himself, walk to the middle of the field and pray and you know, say thank you to, to God for whatever he wanted to, for the health of his players, safety of whatever, like all those different things. And then you know, players from his own team would join him, players from the opposite team would join him, and they would pray in the middle of the field. This literally happens on high school and college and in it professional football fields all over the country all the time, literally all the time. But somebody at the school was like, ah, you know, it seems like this is, you know, kind of a violation of separation of church and state. But the thing is, is this guy never once demanded that anybody join him. He did it by himself, but he wouldn't kick anybody out and be like, no, you can't join me. I'm praying right now. So Gorsuch actually wrote the majority opinion on this one. And this was a great line from the majority opinion. Here it is, quote, the Constitution and the best of our traditions counsel mutual respect and tolerance, not censorship and suppression for religious and non-religious, non-religious views alike. So this was a big win for freedom of religion. Then on June the 30th, they announced the decision of Biden v. Texas. So this is the one miss, I would say, from this session, one of the biggest misses. So a 5-4 decision that ruled in favor of co-president Joe Biden, saying that his administration could not have or could basically have the the ability now to end the Trump-era immigration policy known as the Remain in Mexico policy. So the majority was Breyer, Kagan, and Sotomayor, and they were joined by Roberts and Kavanaugh. And then in the minority, we had Thomas, Alito, ACB, and Gorsuch. And so this one, basically, the Remain in Mexico policy was tremendous for the, uh, the, the sorry, the Trump administration, because basically, if you were waiting to, to have your, your, basically your day in court so that you could potentially receive the status to come into this country because you said you're, you know, you're a refugee, you you need, you need help, all these different things. Um, you had to remain in Mexico while that happened, as opposed to what's going on now, which is like, yeah, sure, come on in. Uh, we're basically not even going to adjudicate this case. We're going to bust you all over the country and just kind of drop you off. And you, you make sure you show up to your, your court date now, see, because you, you, you don't want me to get all mad if you don't show up to your court date and then no one shows up to the court date. So that happened on June the 30th. But then also on June the 30th, they announced the decision in West Virginia versus Environmental Protection Agency. That's the EPA here in the U.S. So this was a 6-3 decision that put the EPA essentially back in its place. The decision would restrict the EPA, which is a government agency full of unelected bureaucrats that can basically work there forever from being able to have the authority to place restrictions on energy production and emissions. Okay. So essentially that authority would have to come from our elected officials in Congress passing a law, you know, which would allow the EPA to do so, which we, we've never given them that ability through a law. So the majority was Alito, Thomas, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, ACB, and Roberts, and the minority was Breyer, Kagan, and Sotomayor. And so basically this was just based, uh, this was a decision that kind of shrunk the size of a particular agency inside the federal government 
which te- technically made the federal government a little bit smaller, which I'm obviously all for. So now we need to talk about why these cases are so important, okay? There's a lot of things to talk about with these cases, and I'll have some some links in the show notes so you can ch- check out the breakdowns, and if you want to read the decisions, you can find those and all that. You know, I'll make sure I, I, I have as much down there for you as possible. But these rulings are literally dealing with the most important aspects of our culture and our modern society. The, all those rulings that I just talked about, they're, they're talking about the most important things that you could possibly talk about. They're talking about life. They're talking about self-defense, freedom of religion and speech and expression, energy production, which, you know, the, the energy that we've created with, with fossil fuels and natural gas and things like that has is created this unbelievable level of, of flourishing for people uh, and people groups all over the globe, right? I mean, th- these are the most important topics that we could possibly be talking about. So sometimes, you know, uh, there's maybe one or two things that come down during a particular session of the Supreme Court, and it may or may not bother you, but or it may or may not affect you directly. But gosh, I mean, these are just the most important topics you could possibly have. But another reason why this session uh, of the Supreme Court was so unbelievably important is because it's giving us this reminder that I talk about all the time, which is elections have consequences. My goodness, elections have consequences. Because, guys, you have to ask yourself this question, whether you're a Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal, uh, you know, somewhere in the middle, which technically doesn't exist anymore. What would this country look like right now if Hillary Clinton had gotten three justices in her first term in office? What would the country look like? I mean, many of these cases wouldn't even uh, even gone before the Supreme Court, but had they gone before them, the outcomes would have been way, way different. So we need to go ahead and break this down because I want to make sure that you understand like tangibly what this means. So if Hillary had run had and had won the 2016 election and was president. I mean, it's crazy to even say Hillary Clinton being the president of the United States, but she would have inherited this court. So here are the conservatives. There would have been three of them. Alito, Thomas, and Scalia. Two swing type people, which are supposedly conservatives, but they're not. They're more swing votes. She would have inherited Roberts and Kennedy, those two. And then four liberal justices, which are solidly liberal. Breyer, Sotomayor, Kagan, and Ginsburg. Okay? That would have been the breakdown of the day she walked into the Oval Office. Okay? But then Justice Scalia died. Okay? So we're just going to run this out as if, you know, she had been in office instead of Trump. So Scalia dies. Now the conservatives would be Alito and Thomas, so two. Swings would have been Roberts and Kennedy, those two. And the liberals would have had five, Breyer, Sotomayor, Kagan, Ginsburg, and Hillary's first pick, okay? Then Kennedy retires, okay? So Kennedy, again, was supposedly a conservative, but basically he was the swing vote of the court. There's no reason to think that he would have held out for another presidential election cycle before retiring. So let's say that would have happened. So there would have been two conservatives, Alito and Thomas, one swing now, Roberts, and six liberals, Breyer, Sotomayor, Kagan, Ginsburg, Hillary Clinton pick number one, Hillary Clinton pick number two, okay? Then you had towards the end of the first term, which would be her first term, Ruth Bader Ginsburg dies, okay? So our SCOTUS would look like this, basically, if we were sitting here right now. This is what our Supreme Court would look like. Two conservatives, Alito and Thomas, one swing, Roberts, and six, count them, six, again, just like on the last one, six liberals, Breyer, Sotomayor, Kagan, And then Hillary pick one, Hillary pick two, and Hillary pick three. So, and here's the thing why, you know, I try to, you know, infuse that as much as possible. Okay. So you look at it as a 6-3 court, but look at how many times Roberts sides with the liberal justices on all these different issues. We can assume with those three picks that Hillary would have gotten, that there would have been, all three of them would have been check, 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 progressive liberals, 100% down the line. Because Democrats don't miss on their SCOTUS picks like Republicans do. Like I read a long uh, section of an article on last week's episode where I broke down all of the mess ups that Supreme Court picks that Republicans have made over the last 40 or 50 years. It is egregious. Republicans miss constantly. Democrats don't. Like they they didn't get, you know, Breyer on the court and they're like, gosh, Breyer just keeps siding with the conservatives. Man, I really wish Sotomayor and Kagan would, you know, kick it into high gear here and, and vote with the stuff that we like. They always vote exactly how you predict. It's only the conservatives that you have to really, what's Roberts going to do this time, you know? But here's the thing. Unfortunately, and this is just kind of another overall thought about, about this in terms of what this means. We have to keep the Supreme Court in mind when voting in our federal elections specifically when we're voting for president and our U.S. senators for our states. Now, I use the word unfortunately because the Supreme Court should not have this much power. There's 
there's the executive, the legislative, and the judicial. Those are the branches of government. And this is just one part of the judicial branch, right? Now, it's the highest part. It doesn't get any higher. That is the Supreme Court in all the, the senses of the word. But it's very, very unfortunate that we have to keep those things in mind, okay? Because this leads to the next thing that is so important about this is if Trump had not won, it is reasonable to assume that we would have seen the degradation of our gun rights and our rights to express ourselves through religion and speech. Uh, and in addition to that, Roe and Casey would still rule and government agencies like the EPA would very likely have their powers expanded. Again, I go back, I, I've mentioned my Uncle Dan now basically every week, but whenever he and I were discussing the 2016 presidential election, if you haven't heard me talk about this before, he said, Kyle, the Supreme Court is way too important for you to you know, get all uppity about Trump not being a good guy. And I was, you know, standing on my morals and saying Trump and Hillary, neither one of them have my, you know, you know, they don't represent the basics of human decency and the standards that I would uphold for myself. So I can't vote for either of them. And boy, could I have not been, I I could not have been more wrong about that. The Supreme Court is that important because just look at it. Can you imagine if it was like seven two, like seven technically liberal justices throwing Roberts in there and two solidly conservative ones, Alito and Thomas, who are both pretty old. Like Alito and Thomas probably aren't going to, you know, go another 10, 15 years on the court. I mean, this is such an unbelievably important time. And I'm so glad that Trump got those picks and not Hillary. But I guess the last thing here on this before we move on to the quick hitters is the, the reason why this story is important is we, as men, we must stay engaged with what's going on around us so that we can effectively push back darkness. Again, we equip men to push back darkness. You are not equipped to push back darkness if you don't know where the darkness is. Or if you see the darkness, but you have no idea how to fight against it. Again, I use the example all the time. You're so fr- you know, frustrated and flustered when you go to your um, you know, school board meeting and you see some of the, the woke stuff that's in your kids' classrooms, but you don't know how to fight back against it. Like, aside from just getting out there and screaming for 60 seconds during your public comments, what exactly are you doing to be able to affect change? Because if you're not going to do it effectively, then you don't need to do it at all. But as men, we are able to push back against this darkness, but we have to fight with the right tools. We have to fight with the right weapons. And again, it goes back to the scripture I used from the very beginning of this podcast, which is when justice is done, it is joy to the righteous, but terror to evildoers. That's Proverbs 21, 15 in the ESV. And I want you to think about that scripture. I'll read it again. When justice is done, it is a joy to the righteous, but terror to the evildoers. Who are the people that are wailing right now in the streets? Again, I, I'm so thankful that the riots have not been anywhere near George Floyd summer, right? Oh, sorry, St. George Floyd, George Floyd summer, right? I'm so glad for that. But these are the people that are just like unbelievably aghast at the fact that the states now have the rights to choose their own laws as it pertains to killing babies. And they're aghast that the state that they live in is going to have just as bad a laws, if not better for people that think like them, right? They're going to be more permissive of abortions, right? But it's not the righteous. They're not the righteous ones right now. Again, when justice is done, it is the joy to the righteous, but terror to the evildoers. So for those of you that were celebrating when Roe v. Wade and and Planned Parenthood v. Casey was overturned, that was you being righteous. That was the joy to the righteous. It was the evildoers were the ones that were screaming out in sheer terror. That's a good thing to remember. All right, guys, let's get into the quick hitter segment. We are going to discuss uh, this first one here. So the mass shooting in Illinois that took place on Independence Day, that's Monday of this week. So this is according to Ryan King of the Washington Examiner. As locals celebrated the 4th of July at Highland Park, this is outside of Illinois, on Monday morning, a gunman believed to have been perched on a nearby rooftop opened fire, killing at least six people and wounding dozens more. Robert Cremo, 22, was taken into custody as a person of interest following an extensive manhunt, and it was later revealed that he had posted videos appearing to muse about committing violent acts, including one video from 2021 that appeared to show him driving down the street that appears to be part of the parade route. A little bit later in the article, it says this. Authorities recovered a high-powered rifle from the scene of the shooting. Shooting. Officials have not divulged what type of rifle was recovered, but Rotering said she believes, I think she's uh, someone with the police force there or the DA or something like that. She said she believes the firearm was purchased legally. Law enforcement is currently working to trace the origins of the weapon, a spokesman for the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and Explosives said. Despite reports of alarming social media posts, Cremo's uncle said he saw no signs of trouble, noting Cremo had not had been unemployed for about two years and largely kept to himself as he attempted to break out as a rapper. Okay, so obviously my initial thoughts on this were, 
just like you guys, I was enjoying the 4th of July. I was enjoying Independence Day and, you know, taking care of the kids and making sure the wife was okay and like doing all those different things. We weren't able to do some of our normal 4th of July stuff just because uh, with the kids being so young, but uh, obviously super tragic, super terrible. Um, I, just to be at a parade like that and then have something like that happen. It is a different kind of evil. Okay. Now, I do think that we should all wait for more information to come out because immediately everybody jumped to their side, the pro gun or the anti gun side or all these different things, the pro police and the anti police side, all these, all these different things. We need to wait because, you know, as I sit here, I'm recording this the day before this comes out. We barely have enough information to make a call here. We don't know a whole lot about this kid yet. And I say he's a kid. He was 22 years old, but we, we know that he, he was a troubled young man. His uncle's super wrong about that. He was troubled. He posted these violent videos. Again, he was obviously influenced by rap music because he was trying to break out as a rapper. His particular style of rap was very, very violent. This was a very, very slight guy. He's like 120 pounds, like really, really small guy. So he's one of those guys that gets a firearm in his hand and he thinks, oh man, this makes me a man. I'm a big man now, right? But here's what we know for sure right now. Anti-gun Democrats will use this as another example as to why they should take firearms away from people like me and you. Because again, you and I weren't perched up on a rooftop trying to shoot up a 4th of July parade, but they don't care about that. They want your evil firearms taken away from you. They want my evil firearms taken away from me, even though in this case, as we saw, this firearm was apparently purchased legally. And again, this is in the state of Illinois, which has some of the strictest gun laws in the entire country. Because Chicago's there, and yet they have some of the highest rates of gun violence anywhere in the world, right? Well, I mean, not the world, anywhere in the country, I should say, because there's crazy gun crime in Central and South America. But again, everybody kind of ran to their side, and again, this is just another example for those people. Another thing that we know for sure is most of the focus will be on the firearm. We know that, and not the killer, okay? They want to focus in on what perpetrated this evil. And in their minds, it was the firearm that did that. I mean, guys, I sent this email out to all of you guys, but I just recently was on the Unbelievable podcast over in the UK where I was debating a anti-gun pacifist Christian activist named Shane Claiborne. And he kept talking about guns killing people and all these guns that have killed people and all these people that have died from guns and all these things. And I kept correcting him and saying, guns are inanimate objects. I actually had my AR right here in front of me and I loaded it with one of those evil 30 round magazines. And this thing, boy, it was, it was a scary weapon. It's got, it's Cerakoted. It's got, you know, pistol grip on the back and a vertical grip on the front. It had a suppressor on it and a scope and like uh, the whole, the whole nine yards, right? I loaded it, kept it on safety and set it down in front of me for the rest of the interview. And don't you know what? That damn thing didn't get up and bite anybody. That thing didn't get up and shoot anybody, right? But that's what happens when you do univariate analysis. And that's what all these people tend to do is you look at a disparity or you look at something that happens and you do the first level of analysis and you just accept it, right? You say, oh, we have all these guns. Look at all this gun violence. I bet you if we take away the guns, we won't have any more of this gun violence. Again, that young man, was a, he became a criminal, but he wasn't a criminal. He was just a person with the intentions to commit a crime when he bought his firearm. This isn't minority report. We can't know when evil is going to happen. But another thing we saw is that these whiny sheep you know, type people, they were inadvertently advocating, you know, right after this to make themselves less safe. These sheep were literally advocating for things to make themselves less safe. So there's a guy on Twitter, there's a guy on Twitter that I saw, I didn't save it or anything like that. This was a guy that was at the parade with his two young daughters and his wife. He said when the shooting started, he grabbed his two young daughters and took off running, tried to get to you know, a house nearby. His wife ran in a different direction. Uh, it was four or five hours before they could actually come back together and know that he, each other was safe and blah, blah, blah. And he's talking about, you know, and then there was another guy talking about, I can't go anywhere anymore. I can't go to, you know, a parade. I can't go to a school. I can't go to a mall. I can't go to a grocery store. I can't go to blah, blah, blah. And all these people, all they're doing is providing ammunition, no pun intended, to people that want to take firearms away from people. Now, it's easy to say as a guy right here that wasn't in that situation, oh, well, I would have, re would have reacted differently. But again, this guy had his wife and two kids there, and he was clearly not armed. Now, that doesn't mean that if he was armed, that he would have been able to, you know, pull the gun out of appendix position, immediately identify where the threat was and take it out. But it doesn't rule that out either. And this is a sheep, this is a good example of a sheep that wants to whine about all these evil things happening around him, and yet he doesn't want to be part of the protective, you know, gap between him and the people that he loves, including himself, I would think. Again, it's these people that just think, oh, if we can get rid of guns, or if we can turn guns into garden tools, or do any of those different things, all of a sudden, evil people won't do evil things. And I'm sorry, in a situation like that, I don't want to be sitting there with my only weapon being my legs, and how fast I can run away from the threat. 
I'm sorry, I'm just not into it. So my big takeaway on this first story is that if you're an anti-gun person, okay, I know there's probably not a whole lot listening, at least not listening still, but if you're an anti-gun person and you're sitting around waiting for that mass casualty event that will cause us to quote unquote do something, keep dreaming, okay? Now, that is not in any way, shape, or form me advocating for any of these things to keep happening, but you keep thinking like, okay, is it going to be a shooting at a uh, country concert in Vegas? Nope. Is it going to be a shooting at a school in Texas? Nope. Is it going to be shooting at a 4th of July event? Nope. Nothing is going to make someone like me say, you know what? That was so egregiously bad. Here are my firearms now. Because what you don't understand, anti-gun person, is that a law-abiding citizen like myself handing my firearms over to the local magistrates, to the government... And they're not going to destroy them. They're going to keep them, right? That doesn't make me safer. That doesn't make the people around me when I have my firearm on me safer. Because I'm not evil. I'm never going to use that firearm to kill an innocent person, right? But I would use that firearm in order to kill somebody that is trying to actively kill me or the people around me. Someone that's evil, an evil demon-possessed criminal. Like, that is why I have my firearms. Or if the federal government decides they want to infringe on my rights to the point, or a, or a government that from outside the United States wants to come here and infringe on my rights, that's part of the reason why I have these firearms. Again, go back to the episode where I talked about the Uvalde shooting. I think it was episode 315. It will be in the show notes. Again, you're not advocating in your behalf, on your behalf. You think you are. You think you're advocating for something that will be to your benefit, but it will only be to your detriment. All right, guys, next quick hitter here. Jordan Peterson, the great and one and only Jordan Peterson, got banned from Twitter. So this is according to Jordan Peterson at The Daily Wire, because if you didn't know now, he is actually a part of The Daily Wire. He signed a multi-year distribution deal where his podcast and other video content is going to be distributed through The Daily Wire. I think that is so unbelievably cool. But here is from a little op-ed that he wrote on The Daily Wire website. A few days ago, I penned an irritated tweet in response to one of the latest happenings on the increasingly heated culture war front in response to the decision of an actress slash actor named Ellen slash Elliot Page. I am employing this awkward and impossible multiple naming style because it is now apparently mandatory and probably doing it wrong. Nonetheless, as you're doing it wrong in is the whole point in what has been made mandatory, but also to make a point. I have essentially been banned from Twitter as a consequence. I say banned, although technically I have been suspended, but the suspension will not be lifted unless I delete the quote unquote hateful tweet in question. And I would rather die than do that. And hopefully it will not come to that. Although who the hell knows in these increasingly strange days. So if you're wondering, or if you didn't see the tweet, here's the tweet. Okay. So he tweeted, remember when pride was a sin and Ellen Page just had her breasts removed by a criminal physician. Okay, that was the original tweet. So this is according to the Daily Wire. Twitter's explanation said that Peterson violated the rules against hateful conduct, an accusation he vehemently denies. Then denies. Okay, so here's the thing. Ellen Page is an actress. She was in Juno. She was in a bunch of different things. And then she kind of went through this thing where I think I'm gay. I think I'm uh, non-binary or whatever. And then she decided, okay, I'm a boy. I'm obviously a boy. I've been a boy my entire life. I'm going to be male and I'm going to do all the things in order to be male. So she got a top surgery done. So she basically had her boobs cut off. Uh, You know, she had other things. I think she had uh, ab implants and all kinds of other things so that she would appear more masculine. Okay. So here's my reaction to all of this. His tweet is 100% accurate. And that's why he was banned. Again, this was a tweet. Remember when Pride was a sin? He tweeted this during Pride Month, the the holy and sainted Pride Month. And Ellen Page just had her breasts removed by a criminal physician. That's all true. So when you say, remember when Pride was a sin, you're basically saying, hey, people don't look at Pride as a sin anymore, which is exactly where we're at. We literally just got done with 30-something days of people having Pride over their sinful lifestyles. So obviously, it's something that people have forgotten. And Ellen Page, right, I have no problem calling her Elliot, whatever your given name is, I have no idea, but I'm not going to call her a him by any stretch of the imagination. He, or she, see, here we go, she had her breasts removed by a physician. And I think people got, you know, really messed up with the criminal physician part, but a criminal, or sorry, a physician takes the Hippocratic Oath and they they basically say they're not going to do any harm. And when you remove healthy breast tissue off of a woman, right, thus creating even more negative potential outcomes for them mentally, That seems pretty criminal to me, but that's why this was banned because we live in this thing where up is down, left is right, blue is red, and that's kind of the life we're living right now where something like that that's true is just seen as hateful, okay? Also, we knew this would happen eventually. Jordan Peterson has been stepping in it and stepping in it on purpose and sometimes on accident since we found out who he was with Bill C-16 over in Canada. 
right? And that kind of launched him into the stratosphere, especially right uh, before he released 12 Rules for Life, which basically launched him into a different universe, right? But we knew this would happen eventually. Because when a guy speaks this much truth, when a guy speaks about authoritarianism and totalitarianism, totalitarianism as much as he does, it becomes an issue for the powers that be, especially when they control all the levers of the public square, which kind of leads to the next point, which is that Elon Musk might bring him back. Again, it's going to take a while for Elon Musk to fully take over the reins of Twitter, but he also might not. Again, Elon Musk is a free speech absolutist as far as we know, but we have no idea how he's going to rule once he actually takes over the reins. He's signaling that he's going to do it in a pretty conservative way, but we don't know that for sure. But also, there are a lot of people saying, and these are people that are on my side, kind of the conservative side. They say it doesn't matter that Jordan Peterson was canceled. He's so big. He's just, he's undeniable at this point. He's basically not cancelable. But it actually does really matter. Because my understanding was that he had millions of followers on Twitter. These are people that get direct access to what he's thinking in that exact moment because he doesn't really do immediate thoughts on Facebook or Instagram or any other type of social media site. There's a bunch of people that clip his stuff on YouTube and on TikTok and all that. But that is his one way to get out his immediate thoughts to his audience. And Twitter just flips a switch and says, oh, you're done now. An interesting timing. This was, I believe, just a few days after he announced that he was going to be a part of the Daily Wire. It was a few days before. It It was kind of all around that time, right? So we probably should have been able to see this coming. But my big takeaway on this story is that Jordan Peterson is 100% making the right call by not deleting the tweet, which may seem as counter to the point I just made saying, hey, you know, now his people aren't going to have direct access to to his thoughts and, you know, his stream of consciousness or any of those types of things. But if he were to delete that tweet because the tech overlord said that he needs to and he's supposed to, it literally goes against every single thing that he has been saying and preaching since he, he came to prominence. He has done so many great things for humanity and so many great things for the people that have followed him and have listened to him and read his works. And if he had deleted that tweet, even quietly, I don't know that he would have recovered. It would have made guys like me look at him like really askant and just be like, mm, did, you, did you just do something that you said that you would never do? Did you just play into the totalitarianism playbook? So I stand by him. I obviously hate it for him that he's lost his ability to tweet for now, but we'll see how it goes in the future. All right, next quick hitter here. Let's look at the spiking drug overdoses in the state of Oregon after they decriminalize essentially all hard drugs. So this is according to Stacey Barrett. She's an attorney at criminaldefenselawyer.com. In November 2020, Oregon became the first state to decriminalize the possession of small amounts of what they call street drugs when voters passed ballot measure 110. Effective February 1st, 2021, possession of the following amounts of drugs for personal use will be a class E violation, which is similar to a traffic ticket, with a maximum punishment of a $100 fine or completion of a health assessment with an addiction treatment professional. So less than one gram of heroin, less than one gram or less than five pills of MDMA, less than two grams of methamphetamine, less than 40 units of LSD, less than 12 grams of psilocybin, that's, uh, you know, mushrooms or whatever less than 40 units of methadone, less than 40 pills of oxycodone, and less than two grams of cocaine. Could you possibly see this going wrong in any way, shape, or form? Well, you guessed right. So according to Leonardo Brasino of the Post Millennial, according to the Oregon Health Authority and their 2022 opioid overdose public health surveillance update on May the 19th, opioid overdose deaths have become sequen- or sequentially worse in the past three years. In 2019, the state's deaths totaled 280. In 2020, that number rose to 472. And in 2021, those deaths reached a staggering 607. That is a 216% increase from 2019. Now, you might say, you know, Kyle, you know, when you went down that entire list, you know, there wasn't, you know, anything on there about, um, sorry, uh, any of the opioids or anything like that wasn't on there, like, except, you know, you could look at oxycodone or different things like that. But when you get these types of drugs on the street, they're laced with any number of things. And one of those things happened to be uh, fentanyl and other things as well that we see these people that they can't get their opioids anymore through their pharmacist or through their doctor. And so they go to the street to get them. And if they can't get the direct thing that they're wanting, they'll do something else to try to take the edge off or take the pain away. Right? So my, my initial reaction to this is obviously this is the reality of a more loving and progressive approach to drug, drug use and drug crime. Because Oregon is obviously very, very, very liberal-leaning state, not just in, in Portland or something like that. It's a very, very liberal-leaning state. And these people thought they were doing the right thing. 
when they voted for this, they're like, eh, this makes sense. Because eventually it'll go to where the, the government can produce some of these things and actually sell it. And they were sold on the lie that this is going to affect the black market and basically eradicate the black market. And they're just like, you know, the war on drugs hasn't worked. And so we're going to try something different. We're going to do something like what Europe did or what I think it was Portugal or somewhere else where they basically have, you know, they basically made all, all crimes or all drug crimes illegal or something like that or decriminalize them or whatever. This is the obvious thing that you could see coming. Because this loving and progressive approach is not tied to reality, like at all. Again, it's a univariate analysis where you're just like, oh, these people, uh, they just keep getting locked up and they keep going back to drugs. Well, let's just legalize it and then all of a sudden everything will be better. And this is also one reason, one of many, why the legalize all drugs people, they just really need to shut up. Because in like Joe Rogan talks about this all the time. There's prominent people on Twitter and everybody else has podcasters like we just need to legalize all drugs. You want to get rid of the black market? You want to make the cartels not as effective? You just legalize all drugs and it'll be just fine. We're seeing a microcosm of what could be a national crisis. Because let's say they just snap their fingers and all drugs are legal in the United States of America. Do you honestly believe that the cartels down in Mexico are going to be like, ah, gosh darn it. Those crazy little miscreant Americans, they, they outsmarted us. I guess we're not going to sell drugs anymore. Of course not. And we see this evidence in a state like California, which has a bigger black market for illegal drugs than they ever had before the legalization of marijuana. It's bigger than it's ever been, way bigger than it's ever been. And you think to yourself, well, why? Well, is it not obvious you have way more people using it now that it's legalized because there are people like me that are rule followers. And then when the rule has changed, it's like, all right, maybe I'll try that. I would never do that, but it's like, maybe I'll try that now. So now you have all the people that were using marijuana beforehand in the state of California. Now you have all these other additional people using it. And what the cartels are doing is they're undercutting the price of the state sanctioned facilities where you can buy it, the dispensaries, because they're putting a tremendous tax on those things. And people are like, gosh, I can pay this amount for an ounce or for a blunt, or I could go to my dude on the street and pay this amount and get the same thing. Maybe it's even better weed. And people are just absolutely flummoxed. How could this possibly happen? It's like, I don't know. Well, if you had used your brain for more than seven seconds before you put this law into effect, you probably could have seen this as a legitimate outcome. And they compare the United States to what we see in these European countries. Like, oh, they, you know, they got rid of these laws and things are better. We're not the same. You're talking about a country that has like one one hundredth the population of our country. And our country is already, you know, on pills about everything, right? You roll your ankle, you get a bottle of pills. You have a bad day, you get a bottle of pills, right? It's different than anywhere else probably in the entire world. So you can't keep looking at these examples from overseas and apply it to what we see here. And the biggest impact of all of this, guys, will be on children. It will absolutely be on children. I can't remember if it was uh, Oregon or another city, but they're seeing an insane an uptick in THC toxicity in minors. And THC, again, that's the uh, psychoactive ingredient of marijuana. This has a tremendously negative impact on the brain of children. It's causing schizophrenic breaks for these kids. You know, having a THC in your system when your brain's not fully developed leads to a myriad of other issues for these people. Again, your brain's not fully developed until you're, you're in your mid-20s or something like that. And again, a lot of these drugs that people are doing now, and if you're a weed person or you talk to people that are weed, people are like, man, the weed now is so much different than it was when I was a kid, right? They were literally almost essentially smoking grass back in the day. Now they're smoking or, or taking edibles or doing rubs or different things like that that have a crazy amount of THC in them. And it's causing tremendous amounts of negative impact. That's what was my biggest argument here in the state of Oklahoma, where I didn't want us to legalize recreational use of marijuana, which we haven't yet. It's all medicinal, still, you know, quote unquote medicinal. It's because when kids, when something like that is legalized, kids will start using it more. Kids will get their hands on it more. And it has a way worse impact on them mentally than alcohol does. Because alcohol, obviously, if, if a kid drinks alcohol, they can get into a car and get into an accident. And there's a lot of stupid things that happen with alcohol when kids are drinking underage. I totally get that argument. But it doesn't have the psychoactive effects of THC. Alcohol doesn't. Like, it's a completely different ballgame. A kid can't drink Jack Daniels as a 15-year-old and it changed their personality or cause them to have some sort of a schizophrenic break. But THC and marijuana, that, that 100% happens. Okay? So the big takeaway on this one is that progressive drug policies are an abject failure in the United States. I've already established that, and that will continue to be so. But also, we have to close down the southern border. 
We've been talking about it and talking about it and talking about it and, you know, build the wall and keep building that wall and all the different things. But here's the reality. We sent $40 billion worth of aid over to Ukraine. It would have taken about $8 billion to create the barrier on the southern border, which would prevent a lot of what we're seeing now. Drug mules literally walking across the border. And here's the thing. People are like, oh, but people are getting drugs over with drones and tunnels and all in and, and cars. And most of it comes through our ports of entry. And so why is it that big of a deal? The thing is, is if you don't have to police the border as much because there's a physical barrier there, you can focus more of your assets on those other places. On, on the borders where people are coming through and smuggling them in vehicles. You can focus on using LIDAR uh, technology to scan, to find for tunnels. Like you can use your resources in such a better way. Okay, but fentanyl is the largest killer of Americans age 18 to 45 right now. Fentanyl overdose, not drug overdose in general, fentanyl, not COVID, not, you know, people being shot up at parades, fentanyl, because people get hooked on opioids by these irresponsible drug pushers, otherwise known as doctors, and then they can't get the pills anymore, but they still need them because they have this unbelievable addiction to it now. So they go to the street to buy what they feel like is oxycodone or oxycontin or whatever the situation is. And wouldn't you know, it, there's fentanyl in there. And it takes a very, very small amount of fentanyl to get someone to die. Again, St. George Floyd, second time I mentioned him on this podcast, he had three times the lethal limit of fentanyl in the system when he died while he was in police custody which is a big reason to think he didn't die because that officer put his you know, knee on his neck. If he had just been found dead on the street, they would have been like, wow, this is a clear overdose because he had asphyxia or he uh, had his, basically his heart exploded during that entire process, which is one of the things that fentanyl will do to you. Again, this is a major, major issue. And I'm so tired, especially of conservatives or libertarians, not really conservatives. They're just like, oh, whatever people want to do. This is a net negative for society. It's a net negative for society. I'm all for, hey, you know, don't let the government tell you what to do and blah, blah, unless it's something that can literally kill you like this, where there's no real response. What's the responsible way to use cocaine? What's the responsible way of, of using uh, methamphetamines? This is way different than someone having a glass of wine or, or a whiskey after dinner. This isn't even close to being the same thing. But You'll keep hearing me talk about it. a few months down the road. We'll get some more data on another state where all these upticks in, in overdoses and fentanyl deaths and all that. Now I'll, I'll just lament it again and nothing will change. So here we go. But here we've gotten to the last part of the podcast here. This is the uh, last quick hitter. I'm going to react to a viral video called the ride home. Okay. So a buddy of mine named Kyle Perkins, he's a guy that I went to college with. This is a guy that's done a lot of coaching. So he's coached, you know, junior high and high school athletes. He's a, he's a fantastic coach. And so he knows a thing or two about coaching and about the relationship between young athletes and their parents. Okay. So this video, he posted this on his Facebook and then I saw it and it just kind of caught me weird. As far as I can tell, it was first posted by an organization called True Sport on their YouTube page back in 2016. So this video is like freaking six years old, but the video for whatever reason that I have no idea and technically don't care went viral last month. So I'll, I'll have a link to the YouTube video and also a link to a tweet that had like 7 million plays of the video or something like that. So it's like a minute and a half thing. And the video starts with a dad getting into a car and his son, you know, getting into the backseat. It looks like his son's maybe, I, I can't really tell, seven, eight, nine years old. He's wearing a soccer uniform and all that. It's obvious they're about to drive home from practice. So... Well, actually, what I'm going to do, if you're watching this on Rumble or on YouTube, I'm actually going to show the entire thing because it's really, really short. I would, I don't think I'll be violating anything. So if it gets, you know, cut out later, I apologize. You can go search for it. It will be in the show notes. And those for you listening in audio, you'll still get the same idea. But just picture a dad in a, you know, suit and tie in the driver's seat and his son in the back seat, you know, looking sullen and downtrodden. So let's go ahead and go to the clip in the video here. So, not your best practice. Can we agree on that? It seemed like you wanted to hang out with your friends more than practice. And that's fine if that's what you want to do. You know, just tell me. Because you can do that anytime. Maybe we can skip your next game. Hmm? Because choosing to waste your time, that's one thing. But wasting my time and your coach's time, that's selfish. You don't care about other people. You don't care about hard work. You don't care about teamwork. That's why you're always on the bench, every time it matters. So, if 
you want to keep playing, you need to take a good hard look at yourself and think about that. All right, so there you go. So people's reactions for the most part are just completely demonizing this father. Like, oh my gosh, I can't believe he did that. What a horrible, horrible person. Oh, that poor kid. Again, this is not, you know, like a documentary. This wasn't like a real dad and a real son. This is just, you know, basically these are actors kind of playing a part or whatever. And so all the reactions were feeling bad for the kid, hate the dad. Oh man, this is such a bad, bad thing. But I don't tend to be a contrarian on everything, but my reaction could not have been farther away from what these people were doing and saying. Okay. For the most part, I am totally okay with this video and what was depicted in the video. I'm totally okay with it. Okay. Now I'm going to go into the reasons why I'm okay with this video. First reason, the dad is present. Okay. The dad's there. Again, I talk about all the time in all race groups, in all ages and different things like that. Dad is almost always not present. So I'm okay with the video in that aspect because dad's just there. But again, they only show the dad being around when he's doing something that they frame as bad, which I find interesting. So that's the first reason. Another reason why I'm okay with this is the dad is engaged enough to have this hard conversation with his son in the first place. Because the dad inherently had to have been at practice to have viewed the things that he viewed, right? So he's engaged enough to be at practice, not have his head buried in his phone or in a book or something like that. So dad was engaged. Enough. I like that. Another reason why I like it is he starts with a question. So kind of a statement question. But the dad says this to his son. Not your best practice. Can we agree on that? He didn't just tear into him. He started out with a question. Got the kid thinking. The kid automatically had to have been on his heels. Like, yeah, it probably wasn't the best practice, right? And then another quote. The dad says this. It seemed like you wanted to hang out with your friends more than practice. I think this was the real one that turned people away. Like, oh, you know, when you when you play sports, like it's so good because you get to develop these deep friendships and it's great. Why would the dad hate that? Like, that's kind of where people went with this. But here's the thing, guys, and you know this to be true. You don't have to play store, sports to hang out with your friends. You don't have to play organized sports. Because here's the thing. Organized sports, especially uh, for school districts that don't have, you know, school sports or things like that. These are very, very expensive sports to play. It's not just the equipment and the cleats and and the the uniforms and all those different things. It's traveling. There's a ton of time commitment with youth sports. Like I look back on all the baseball that I played on, all the traveling all-star teams I played for, and my parents were there for every single tournament and staying in hotels and driving. And I mean, gas wasn't $1,000 a gallon like it is now. But like, man, tons of money and time that my parents spent while I was just having fun playing sports, right? And here's the deal. Is if the kid is just going to fart around with his buddies, you can do that at home for free. Have all your buddy, all your buddies over, play video games, and eat pizza rolls. That's not very expensive. But buying a bat and buying cleats and buying a whole uniform and traveling all over uh, the all over creation during the summer months, right? Think about all the people that are playing baseball right now. All the kids that are playing baseball right now. When gas is the price that it is. And hotels are more expensive. Everything's more expensive. And you're, you know, your team in Edmond, Oklahoma, and you have to drive to Dallas for a tournament, right? This isn't a small thing. So again, if the kid clearly just wants to hang out with his buddies, there's perhaps a better way to do that. Another reason why I like this is the dad says that it's selfish for the kid to waste his time and his coach's time. Okay? And everyone's like, oh, no, it's not the kid that's selfish. It's the dad that's selfish. But here's the thing. The dad is 100% in the right about this. That is 100% true. It is a hard truth, but it is true. There are kids that play youth sports that are wasting their parents' time and wasting the coach's time. They're not listening to the coach. They're farting around. They're not taking it seriously. And like that, that's not a good thing. It goes back to the point I just made about the amount of time, effort, and money that goes in from the parents in order for the kid to just screw off. Like I, I'm just not a big fan of that. And I guess the, the last thing here in terms of I like it, there was this quote here. So now you think this was the very, very end. If you want to keep playing, you need to take a good, hard look at yourself. I love that line from the dad. I love that line from the dad. Because he's giving the kid a choice from the very beginning of this statement. If you want to keep playing. So the kid has to decide, do I want to keep playing or do I not want to keep playing? 
Do I want to take this seriously or do I not? I think that's a good thing to put your kid in that headspace. You need to take a good hard look at yourself. I agree with that. Now, how much internal dialogue can an eight or nine year old have with themselves as it pertains to them playing sports? Not a crazy amount. Again, it's not an adult we're talking about here, but you're giving the kid an option saying, if you want to keep playing, obviously I'm fine with that, but you really need to take a good hard look at what you're doing. Now, for intellectual honesty, which I preach about all the time, here is one thing that I saw in that short video that the dad said that I wasn't, you know, crazy about. He said this, quote, you don't care about other people. You don't care about hard work. You don't care about teamwork. That's why you're always on the bench every time it matters. That one caught me a little rough. It was that last part because his kid may not care about other people. He may not care about hard work and he may not care about teamwork, but there's probably a lot of reasons aside from that, that he's on the bench when, when it matters. Okay. I felt like that was a low blow that the kid probably can't internalize. Well, I couldn't think of a way, you know, philosophically where dad could turn that around to be a great teaching moment for the kid. Okay. But again, overall, I'm fine with almost all of this. That was the only part that was like, eh, that was probably a little bit much. Okay. Now, above all, this just shows the inherent issues. Like I've talked about several times on the show already with only doing a univariate analysis. Okay. So at the very, very end, they put this quote up on the screen. The quote was this. If you didn't see it, it just, it said this up there. It said 70% of kids quit sports before high school. 70 kids, 70% 70 of kids quit, quit sports before high, high school. So the obvious implication here is they're doing this. They're quitting because of concerned or overzealous dads getting onto their kids on the drive home. Okay. Which begs the question, is it possible that there are other Perhaps many other reasons why kids quit playing sports. Like a kid becoming interested in something other than sports, like maybe music or drama or speech and debate or model you in or their church uh, youth group or civic groups or on and on and on and on and on. Is that possible? Maybe the kid sucks at sports. Maybe the kid's just really, really bad at it and they want to, they're gravitating towards something that they're better at. Maybe they, they're a really, really good student and they're like, man, I'm wasting so much time, you know, at football practice when I could be reading books as opposed to getting concussions, right? And maybe they go to a school where it's really, really, really hard to make varsity, right? I went to a very competitive 6A school in high school. It was hard to make varsity regardless of the sport that you picked, right? Because we had so many good athletes and there were so many kids that wanted to play. Some kids aren't built for competition. So that could be a reason why they quit. Maybe they developed a physical ailment or an injury, or a sickness that kept them from continuing, okay? And I could go on and on and on. There are so many reasons why kids quit sports, okay? But when you do this, again, univariate analysis, like, oh, 70% of kids quit sports. It's got to be because their dads are hard on them. It's like, or not. I'm sure there are some kids where that's the thing. It's like, oh, it's just not fun anymore. I don't want to do it. They could just be in a crappy kid. That that could be what they're doing at that moment, okay? But here's my big takeaway from, from this, this video and this whole thing. You absolutely should be hard on your kids within reason. You should be hard on your kids. Okay? Now, I want to be clear about this, what I'm not advocating for. I'm not advocating for you being that dad. Okay, major air quotes for those just listening to this. That dad. The dad that couldn't hack it, the dad that didn't make it to the majors, the dad that didn't get the college offer, that is living through their child trying to make sure that their child, you know, gets on the PGA tour someday or that their child can turn pro in whatever random sport that they're getting them into. Hey, you know, we're not going to focus on doing all the sports. We're going to, you're going to be a wrestler and you're going to be a wrestler from the age of, you know, four and up and you're going to be a co collegiate wrestler and you're going to go and you're going to become an all American. Blah, blah. That dad, I'm not advocating for that. Kids can feel that they can feel the pressure. You know, one of the most legendary, uh, 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 coaches in wrestling lives right down here, uh, close to me. His name's Hardell Moore. I've had him on the show before. Like he's very, very adamant about dads that are like that. He's like, no, nah, I don't have time for that. He's like, that kid's seven years old. That kid just needs to show up at the tournament on weight. That that's his biggest accomplishment. And if he does well while he's wrestling, that's fine. And if you notice a lot of these team captains, someone actually did a study of this years ago, they, they studied all these team captains and almost none of these team captains for all these different sports all over the world, right? From the NFL to major league baseball to EPL, everything. These kids were not the best players on their high school teams, maybe not even in their collegiate teams, but they developed into being one of the most important players on their team because they had that leadership ability and they had that knack for it. They weren't the most talented, but they had the knack for it, right? 
And so kids uh, might be missing, missing out on that. But again, you can be hard on your kid without being that dad that's trying to live through your kid. Okay. Now, I think I've told this story on the podcast before. You, you have to make sure that kids focus on the one thing that they can control, and that's their effort and their output. That's all they can control. Now, I learned this accidentally from my father because in sixth grade, I was playing football at the time. And again, it's sixth grade football. This isn't, you know, no one's getting watched by, you know, the local uh, university to see if they're going to get a scholarship offer. So our team was terrible. Our fifth grade year, we won zero games, scored zero touchdowns. Uh, Our sixth grade year, we won our first game, scored some touchdowns, but I think we lost the rest of them. It was just bad, bad year. So we go to practice. I think it was randomly like a Saturday practice or something like that. And I feel terrible. I feel awful. I'm clearly, clearly sick. So I don't have a, a high output practice. I was slow on the sprints. Uh, my mind was elsewhere when we were running plays and different things like that. And I got to tell you, in the short drive from the field to my house, my dad ripped me up one side and down the other, right? Similar, actually way, way worse than what the dad did in this video. Just destroyed me. And here, I'm sick. I'm, I wanted to give full effort to practice, but I couldn't. I physically could not do it. And later that day or the next day, I went to the doctor. They confirmed I had the flu, that I was sick. And my dad's way of apologizing to me, he didn't say I'm sorry, but he got me a couple of uh, boxes or bags of like Parmesan goldfish, which was like my favorite at the time or something like that. And I've always remembered that because it was like, "Eh, that's dad saying sorry in his own way. And and he, he gets it. But the reason why my dad did that was the same reason why he would get mad at me for sports related things all throughout my sports career. The only time my father would get mad at me was when I didn't give full effort. Again, my dad is not this deep. He's not sitting there uh, reading Marcus Aurelius and doing deep philosophical thinking about how to, you know, enshrine these great rights of manhood and different rites of passages for his son and different things like that. That wasn't just who, that just wasn't who my dad was. But he instinctively knew in a way and instilled this in me that you can only control your level of effort. So for baseball specifically, I would have games where I would strike out three times, ground out one other time, and have a few errors in the outfield. And the only reason my dad would rip into me after the game would be on that ground out if I didn't sprint through the bag at first. Effort. Because in, and I know when you get into upper levels, you see guys dogging it, not really running hard and all those different things. But the best baseball player on planet Earth right now is a guy named Mike Trout who goes hard on just about everything, right? And he's the best. He knows the guy's probably going to throw him out, but he's going full bore almost all the time, right? But my dad would only get into me if I didn't give full effort. If I didn't sprint to my position, I usually played outfield. If I didn't sprint to my position and sprint back to the dugout. As, you know, if I struck out and went to the dugout and spiked my helmet and threw my bat and threw a little hissy fit and all that, oh boy, oh boy, was I going to have a rough time on the way home. But if I struck out three times, had a couple errors in the field and had a ground out and I sprinted to my position, did all those different things, we would just get in the truck and go home. There was no shame. There was no, you didn't have your get head in the game and we're going to go home right now and we're going to hit a thousand balls and, you know, we're going to wor- worry about your plate discipline and we're going to talk about it. We're going to, nope. Never once. My parents technically didn't care if I played sports or not, but if I did play, full effort. Full effort all the time. So, inherent in this video, going back to this video, it would seem that this kid was probably playing around, farting around, not giving full effort at practice. And if you don't give full effort at practice, unless you're, you know, some sort of savant in your sport, you're probably not just going to turn it on when it's game time, when the lights are on, when everybody's focused on you and you need to have output not only for yourself, but also for your teammates. So I'm totally okay with a dad coming down hard on his kid that obviously was not giving full effort, okay? And we live in this world now where it's seen as mean and rude and judgmental if a father comes down on his kid hard for something like this, for lack of effort. And, oh, you know, they they just weren't feeling it that day. And gosh, they're developing friendships. And don't be so crazy. It's not like they're going to be a professional athlete. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about controlling the controllables. I got that from Coach Moore. Controlling the controllables. You can control your effort and your output, and that is it. So for all of you complaining about this video, stop it. You're wrong.
All right, guys, before we let you go, we are going to do a quick resilience boost. Add Undaunted Life, our mission is equipping men to push back darkness with content that forges spiritual, mental, and physical resilience. So I've got the information that I talked about from the very, very beginning. So you can get a hold of Chester Evett at Mama Bear's Armory in Gardner, Montana, and Hells Aurora and Outfitters. Guys, I've got the, the phone number there. Call Chester today. Email him today. You know, have him tell you what he's got in there. Let's clear out his inventory and go ahead and book something with Hells Aurora and Outfitters. Guys, I know a lot of you guys do those. So just choose choose a slightly different one. Go do one of those horseback things and obviously please support uh, please keep supporting stevenson knives then here are all the links that i've got from the show so i've got a link to the 100 books every modern christian man should read list i've got a link to the book fearless by eric blim my favorite book of all time i've also got a link to this was an article by the week, so it was eight, eight highly consequential SCOTUS rulings this term explained, so that's a good breakdown. I've got links to episodes 326 and 315 of the show, and then the rest of the links are just stuff that I talked about on the Quick Hitter segment. All right, guys, thanks so much for listening to the show. We do appreciate it. Wherever you're listening to this, please subscribe, rate, and leave us a positive five-star review. If you want me to come speak live at your event or on your podcast, just shoot me an email to info at undaunted.life. That's I-N-F-O at undaunted.life. Follow us on Instagram and like us on Facebook, and check out our website for everything else, including how to donate to keep more content like this coming your way just go to www.undaunted.life and as always we want to thank the band august burns red for allowing us to use their music for our content the music on this podcast is their song cutting the ties which is off their 10th anniversary re-recording of their album leveler the links are in the description i'm your host kyle thompson remember keep pushing back darkness keep forging spiritual mental and physical resilience keep seeking the lion of judah <laughs>